so in this section, it's going to seem like we're doing basically what we did in the last section, but it's going to seem slightly different. And the reason why is in our last section, 12.1, we had our line of y equals our beta 0 plus beta 1 x. And this was the line, this is the theoretical model for our line for the entire population, meaning we have all the data. But in real life, we almost never have all the data. So just like everything else we've done in this class, we talked about like populations versus samples. Now we're going to do almost exactly the same thing, but it's for samples. So section 12.2 is for now our sample data. So in practice, if we don't have all the population data, we won't know what beta zero and beta one are. So instead we have to estimate them by finding the best line to fit our data. And once we have our best line, we can calculate our slope and intercept. So in this example, we have some gas companies, okay, and you have the temperature and the fuel that they would need. And this is something we usually do in classes. I say, okay, here's the graph. I have three of them here. And I want you to tell me, how would you decide the best line? Because maybe someone might think this one's the best line, and another person might think this is the best line. And another person might think this one's the best line. And how do you tell? So the way that you tell, okay, this is usually how where I have you brainstorm, but let's skip the brainstorming because it's a video. Okay, and we'll go to the actual answer. Now this doesn't necessarily have to be the best answer, okay, as much as it is the traditional answer. Now there are reasons, very good reasons, that this is our traditional result, but it's not the only thing that can happen, or the only thing that people ever use. But this is called the least squares method. So for every possible line, you're going to find the vertical distance between each point and the line. So like here's a point, and we look at this distance. Or here's another point, and we're going to look at this distance, this distance, this distance, this distance, etc. And we go through, and every one of these distances is called epsilon i or like this one's epsilon 1, this one's epsilon 2, this one's epsilon 3, etc. So you find every single difference between the line and the point. But if you look at these, some of these are going to be above the line and some are below the line. And if you added those up, the positives and negatives would cancel each other out. So instead, we square each distance. Then we would add up the squares of all of the distances, and we'd pick the line that has the smallest total squared distances, which is called least squares. Now a few things, if you're going to linear regression, you do need to have an explanatory variable and a response variable, so it does matter which one's x and which one's y. I notice here, we're minimizing the sum of each error term squared. And again, the error term is just the difference between your actual point and the line. So yi is your actual point, and this entire thing is the equation of the line. So when we do these squares, we get what we call our regression line. It's going to be a straight line, and it describes how our response variable y changes as the explanatory variable x changes. And we can use our regression line to predict the value of y for any value of x. The equation of our line, notice this is exactly the same as our theoretical model in our last section, but we put a little hat on it to tell ourselves that this is what we're calculating or estimating from the sample. So we use the hat because we're using sample data. sample data to estimate our population parameters. So that's why everything has a hat on it. So y hat is our predicted y value. There are two ways you can interpret this. Both are correct. You can say that y hat i is the predicted individual y value for your specific x value. Or you can say it's the predicted average y value for your given x value. 
either way, you get the same thing. Okay, um, beta naught hat is the estimated intercept. Beta little one with a hat is the estimated slope. And sigma squared hat is the estimate of our error variance. We'll call it mean squared error or MSC. You can think of it as kind of like the average of all of your squared residuals. Okay, now we're going to use software to find the least squares regression line. Some teachers make you guys actually do this by hand. That's just silly in my mind. That's what computers are invented for. Okay, let's talk about a few more things. So we have what's called residuals. The residual or the error term is the difference between the predicted value and the observed value. So the residual is always going to be your actual observed value minus the predicted, or if you prefer, it's your actual minus the expected. Or yi is the actual, yi hat is the predicted. Now there's something called extrapolation. This is when you use a regression line for predictions, but the x values that you're predicting for are far outside your range of the x values used to actually obtain the line. And these predictions are often inaccurate because you can't guarantee that the relationship between x and y remains the same for x values outside your original data. Right. So what would this look like? Okay. You might have, okay, so let's say this is your actual data that you have. And that seems to be following a nice line. And maybe outside your actual data that you didn't actually find, it contains being straight line. And that would be nice. But there's nothing that says that's what it has to be. Maybe it looks like that, but then you hit a carrying capacity and it dropped off. So the, the relationship changed. Or maybe it even would look like that, but then outside of that, it started going down. The point is that outside of your actual data range, you don't know what the rest of the data is doing. It might keep being aligned, but it might have a reason to care, level off or even start going back down. Those are all very realistic, real life situations that this could happen. So if your x values are pretty far from your data you used to get your line, realize that your predictions might not be accurate. This is what we'll actually be using or doing for linear regression now. So using Megastat, we can find the least squares regression line for the fuel consumption example. And the mean square error is 0 0.4280. So looking here at my scatter plot, okay, you can see the points are fairly close to the line. Notice it tells you the equation of the line y equals negative 0.128x plus 15.838. And it also tells you an r squared value, which we haven't really talked about yet. Let's see, before I start, the mean square error, remember we said that is how they estimate the variance of the residuals. So we'll do a sigma squared, but we put a little hat on it to remind ourselves that it's the predicted or estimated variance of the residuals is 0.428. So first, what is our linear regression model? That's just asking what's the regression line? This is po possibly one of the easiest questions I can ask you because all you have to do is copy it down from the graph. So y equals negative 0.128x plus 15.838. What is your estimate of the intercept? So your estimate of the intercept is the number that's by itself. Okay. Remember slope is always next to the x, the intercept's by itself. So our estimate for our intercept is 15.838. Now, let's interpret it. So the interpretation of the intercept is always if x is 0, y equals 15.838. So that's kind of your basic, now let's do it in words. So if x is our temperature, so if temperature is 0 degrees, we expect to use about 15.838 units of fuel. Now we're kind of putting in here the word expect or sometimes we'll say on average because each week with zero degrees of temperature isn't going to be exactly the same. This is just kind of the average or what we expect. Let's look at our next one. What is beta hat one? And interpret it. So 
That means find the slope. And our estimate of beta 1 is the number with the x, so negative 0.128. And computation is basically saying if x goes up 1, y goes up, or in this case, because it's negative, y goes down 0.128. Okay, now let's say it in words. So if the temperature increases by 1 degree, we expect fuel consumption. to go down by about 0.128 degrees, or units. Which makes sense, the warmer it gets, the less fuel you should be using. Let's see, so number four, let's predict the weekly fuel needed if the temperature is 39 degrees. So this is saying, If Sorry, I'm not sure here where I stopped recording without realizing it, so let's just do a quick recap. So I want to predict the weekly fuel for 39 degrees, so all I had to do is plug x equals 39 into the equation of my line, so I got my predicted value. And then we want the residual for week 4, so we went back up and looked at our table for week 4. And on our table, week 4 had a temperature of 39 degrees and an actual value of 10.8 for y. So the actual y is 10.8. And then for the predicted, on week 4, x equaled 39. And y equals the actual value was 10.8. But here, my predicted value for x equals 39 was 10.846. So let's try our next example. Let's predict the fuel needed if the temperature is 57.8 degrees. So x equals 57.8. And truly again, we just plug it in the line. So y, now technically this should have a y hat on it to remind ourselves that this is our predicted value. So I'm going to come back up here and remind myself that that is a y hat. And the equation of our line is negative 0.128x plus 15.838. So just negative 0.128 times rx value of 57.8 plus 15.838 gives me 8.4396. Now let's find the residual for week 6. So come back up. For residuals, you always have to know your actual data. At week 6, we have a temperature of 57.8 and an actual value of 9.5. So the table of actual values for week 7, or sorry, week 6, x was equal to 57.8 and the actual y value was 9.5. Okay, so let's find our residual, which is always your actual y minus your predicted y. So our actual y value is 9.5, and our predicted y, well, if x is 57.8, we already found that predicted y value up above of 8.4396. So our residual is... 1.0604. Now, if you want, you could say this is epsilon 6 because it was the residual for the sixth week. Let's see, next, let's predict the fuel needed if the temperature of the week is 93 degrees. So x equals 93. So we just plug everything in. The equation of my line is negative point one point one two eight x plus fifteen point eight three eight. So we just plug in x equals ninety three. So our predicted value. So once I plug it in, is three 
3.934. Now this is kind of a special one that I want you to look at now. This was for a temperature of 93 degrees. Where is 93 going to fall on my graph? So here's 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 80, 90. So 93 is probably about here. And we got about three units of fuel. Now I might ask you, do you think that this is going to be accurate? Notice they're only charting our graphs up to about 62 degrees. Do you think that this relationship will continue to the 93 degrees? And I would say probably not. Because once you hit about 65 or so, I think most people are going to turn off their heaters. So they're not going to need nearly as much fuel. So I think your line would probably keep going down steadily and then it would probably like drop and stay the same. Or if you actually have maybe a gas AC, I don't know if that exists anywhere, then maybe your fuel would start going back up because you want to cool off your house. But probably most likely it reaches about that 65 and then drops off and stays down at the same level no matter how hot it gets. It would be my first guess. So I think that relationship probably does not continue steadily and so this is going to be extrapolation. So let's make ourselves a note that we did do the prediction as asked, but it's probably not going to be accurate. So I can do the prediction and sometimes that's the best guess that we have and we'll take it even though we realize it's probably not accurate. But keep in mind if you are asked to find something for data that's far away from your original data, it's probably inaccurate. And finally, what is our estimate of our error variance? The error variance would just be sigma squared, but we're looking for the sigma squared hat, or estimate, which is just our mean square error. And it told us on the previous page, just in the problem statement, if I can find it, <laughs> that that was 0.4280. And let's do another problem here. Let's do number 10. What is the correlation? So you might wonder, how can we tell that? So it turns out, if you come up and look at this graph here, when they tell you R squared, that R squared is really your correlation squared. So if r squared equals 0.899, then that means r is just the square root of that. Which is 0.948. That's a pretty high correlation, that's pretty close to 1. Meaning that this is a fairly strong relationship. So just looking at this with the R squared, I can then take the square root and find R for our correlation. So let's just write that down. R equals the square root of R squared, so R 0.948. Let's try another example. So Quality Home Improvement has five stores. They want to study the relationship between home value in thousands of dollars and Y, which is yearly expenditure in dollars. Data is collected on a random sample of 40 homeowners using Megastat. We can plot the data, find the equation of the line, and find the mean square error is 21,578. So mean square error, or sigma squared hat, equals our 21,578. And the equation of the line is 7.258x minus 348.392. And also tells us r squared equals 0.889. Okay, so first, what's the equation for our linear regression model? Well, just y. And now we put a hat on in this class to remind ourselves that this is estimated from the sample data. 7.258x minus 348.392. What is beta zero hat? Interpret it. Does it have a practical interpretation? So this is asking for our intercept. So saying when x equals zero, y equals what? So in our case, our intercept is 
negative 348.392. So our estimate for the intercept is again this negative 348.392. Now let's interpret it. So this is saying if the home value is zero, now home value is in thousands of dollars, so zero thousand dollars, we expect home upkeep cost to be negative. 348.392 dollars. So, does this seem practical? Well, first of all, can you have a home that's worth zero dollars? No, homes cost something. We're not talking about what you're going to buy it for, but what the home is actually worth. And also, if someone having a negative upkeep value means that someone's like paying you to live there, and that's just not going to be practical. Okay, now this is okay. There are many times that your intercept does not have a practical interpretation. We need our intercept to get a good fit for our line, but it doesn't mean that our intercept will actually be useful or interpretable. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. We care much more about the next one, which is our slope. So it's asking us for our slope, and the estimate of our slope is the number in front of the x, so it's 7.258. And this says if x goes up 1, upkeep, or y, goes up 7.258. So what does this mean? So if the value goes up by about $1,000, or if you have a home that's $1,000 more than someone else, we would expect the upkeep to increase by seven dollars and twenty-five cents. Now four, predict the upkeep for John's home, which is valued at two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Now first of all, X is in thousands of dollars, so X is actually just two hundred and twenty. And that's one of the things that I see people mess up on the most is they forget to change their units. So y hat again is 7.258x minus 348.392. So let's just plug in x equals to 20. And we get 1248.392. So John, his home is seems pretty nice and he's going to be spending about twelve hundred dollars a year just on upkeep. Now this is the upkeep for John's home. This next one says, it's our prediction for John. This one says predict the average upkeep for all the homes that are valued at two hundred twenty thousand. Well it turns out you do the exact same thing, nothing changes, it's just a different way to interpret it. So it's still going to be twelve thousand four hundred or twelve hundred and forty eight dollars and thirty seven cents. Now let's predict the yearly upkeep for a home worth one million five hundred thousand. So x equals fifteen hundred. Now looking at our graph, our x's only go up to three hundred. So fifteen hundred is going to be somewhere way, way out here. So that's definitely extrapolation. And it's so far off, I think I'm probably really going to be quite inaccurate. And so here I would say that this would be extrapolation. And so you could predict it, but it would probably be inaccurate and not worth our time. Okay, and just one more thing. I didn't ask it, but what if I asked you what the correlation is? You can come up here to r squared, and if r squared is 0.889, then r is just the square root of that. So the square root of 0.889 is 0 0.9428. So that's a pretty strong correlation. Those points are pretty close to the line. And our next page, okay, you can read through this in your own book in more detail. Let me just kind of explain it. So one thing we have is what's called a lurking variable. So we've interpreted our slope as the change in the predicted value of y if x goes up by 1. 
but we can't actually show that a change in x causes a change in y. Rather, regression can only be used to establish that the two variables move together and the explanatory variable contributes information for predicting the dependent variable. So we're not actually showing causation here. We're not saying increasing the home value causes upkeep to go up, just that they're associated and one is useful for predicting the other one. So for instance, we have this called association versus causation. For instance, as mattress sales have increased in the past, college professor salaries have also increased. Now does this show that professor salaries depend on mattress prices, or increasing ma a mattress price causes a college professor salary to go up? No, that would be silly. This is, both variables are influenced by a third variable, a lurking variable, which is long run, long run growth in the national economy. So this is just our lurking variable. So just because we have a nice association, even if our points are really close in line, it doesn't mean that X is causing a change in Y. It just means that they're related. Now sometimes there is actually X causes a change in Y, but in many situations it doesn't. They're just related. And also outliers, okay? So linear regression is very influenced by outliers are very sensitive outliers. If an observation has a strong influence on the regression line, we could call it an influential point. So in this example, we have here just a nice linear regression model. We have an R squared of 0.748, so you can kind of guess what the correlation would be from that by taking the square root. My points are fairly close to the line. Now if I add in just this one point, notice that the actual line itself moves. So this is an outlier and it moved the entire line. And the correlation went way down. So if R squared goes down, that means the correlation is also a lot lower. And notice over here, I added this one outlier, and it made the line go way down. That line's not even going through the points anymore. Okay? So just one outlier can really goof up your entire line.